Did you feel that the Hazel that came out the end of Breaking Glass was a completely different person to the one that went into that project? Oh, probably, yeah. Uh, well, because I was pretty naive. I was naive on all kinds of levels. Um, it was all very exciting to be offered to do a job that probably I wasn't really <laughs> fit for when it started um, uh, because I was learning, uh, I was learning this, the acting thing, the job of filming, and there's all sorts of things you have to know, uh, which I didn't know, I was just naive. Mm -hmm. Things like, uh, something like a, a close-up, which is when the camera comes into your face and you read your lines and it's very... And I remember seeing Alec Guinness say something about it on telly once when he got some huge award for a lifetime achievement. And he said, well, he says, I don't really know what this is all about because when I was in a, a acting school, they make you put a little frame around your head to practice for your close-ups. And, um, you know, a lot of actors, you, I don't know if there's any actors here, so I don't want to be rude, but they kind of have a bit of a self-inflated idea of themselves, and we call them lovies, you know, darling. And, and, and uh, this self-important idea is daft sometimes, especially when Alec Guinness said, and actually, uh, what I learned in acting, the best thing you can do is nothing, because the camera sees everything, every little thing. It's like when we take photographs, you know, and, and you go, oh, don't like that photo, because you're trying so hard, you know, and everybody's going, cheese. <laughs> and in fact, really, to do the least is the most important, but what you feel, you have to try to portray. So I learned all this craft really quickly. I had people like Phil Daniels and, oh God, all of them, Jonathan Price, the whole lot, trying to, you know, give me tips and teaching me. But what really hurt me or hurt my soul and my heart or whatever was that slowly every lunchtime I would do interviews and, I, and initially I thought oh this is lovely everybody wants to be my friend but actually of course they don't want to be your friend they want to get some old scoop on you that uh, apart from Pete you've never done that never you never get that from me I'm sure you but usually uh, and then you start to read stuff that you said, and it, it's not how you said it exactly. And um, my mum would phone me up sometimes and be crying and say, Oh, Hazel, I didn't know that it uh, happened. And um, there, so the girl that went in and the girl that came out, by the time I came out, I'd gone through a sort of a machinery, which I didn't expect. So it must have been an incredible time to actually be thrown into something like, say, thrown into, but you know what I mean? Finally reaching that. I mean, tell us a little bit more about how it how it was for Hazel O'Connor to be suddenly to be this star. Everybody wants a piece of you. Um, well, you it, see, it's all what's the word? Subjective or objective? Subjective. Subjective. Subject. Because all I can for me. So you're not going to really probably get the answer you want. For me, this is how it was. It's lunchtime. We've worked since six thirty in the morning and it's uh, 12 30 and i'm going yeah because i love food what am i going to have and all that silly little stuff that you do every day in your life and suddenly the pr person from the studio comes up and says oh no hazel we've got the daily mail coming in at uh, tw quarter to one and then at quarter past one for 15 minutes you've got a radio interview and in on the telephone and then it's back to work and i so thought oh that's nice for a bit and then after a week and and continuous continuous working every day and through my lunch hour I started to think I don't really want this this is not what I've signed up for but of course I did but I didn't know that that's what I signed up for so again I'm sorry my answer is subjective mm. that as me as the person it I started to feel more and more like a thing that didn't need to eat, didn't need to go to the toilet, didn't need to wash my face, didn't need to do anything but just be, you know, the actress for the afternoon, the singer or the uh, person that yaps to um, publicity machine. Welcome to the machine, I was just yeah. going to say that. Uh, so it's, that yeah. sounds really horrible, I don't mean to be disrespectful mm. because I, it was fun. Were you always intended or what do they always intend you to write the songs for the film? No. So how did that come about? That's a commentary working class opportunist. <laughs> right, go on. <laughs> well, uh, when I... Because that's, I mean, that was a major thing, wasn't it? The fact that those songs... <laughs> it was mad. Mm. It was mad that it came about because they were talking about um, people like Elvis Costello or um, one of the different people that were very Sweet well known. Or 
No, but I can't remember even. No. There was zillions of different, you know, famous people that were going to write the songs. And um, when they decided they were going to let me play the lead, uh, I immediately went home. They sent me a script, and I, I don't know about reading the script, but I just went <laughs> quickly, looked through it, and thought, where's the songs? Where's the songs? And, uh, you know, they kind of marked where the songs would be and what the song was about. And I, the original script was written by a fella called Howard Schumann, who some people will remember this series on TV called Rock Follies. Um, it wasn't my cup of tea, and it frightened me that he was going to be writing a script about street people, you know, the punk scene, and I felt that he knew nothing about it, so it really worried me. And then when I saw the lyrics to the songs that were in this script, the first script, they were just banal and not how we all spoke in those days, how it was. So I, uh, I just thought, well, I'll just look at the subjects and then I'll try and put something together. And I started to do that and I'd go into the producers every other day with another song. I, it was a time for me to become prolific and it's never, it, I've never enjoyed that again in my life the same. But just something was channeling through. And maybe it was because we had that awful woman, you know, in charge of England at the time, um, Margaret Thatcher. There was so much food for thought because the, you know, the unions were starting to be bashed. Um, the love convoys were getting bashed. Everybody was getting bashed. Um, yeah, so there was so much food for thought. So anything that was banal in the, in the script that I saw, I erased it, put something else in, went to the producers, said, I've got an idea for a song. I think the first one actually was Big Brother um, because the, the reason in the script was the, the song had to have something to do with being so offensive that BBC Radio wouldn't play it. That was for the plot of the script. And so I, I thought, well, you know, and in those days, it seems so really soft now, but in those days, you know, to say the word arse, on radio would be unthinkable. The BBC would bleep it. Um, so I, that's the first one I looked at, the song that was supposed to not get played on the radio. Um, and I thought, Ooh. and I could say all the things I wanted to say, how I felt politically at the time, which was just fabulous. And as I did it, they, they started going, oh, maybe we should let Hazel write another song. Oh, maybe we should let Hazel do the whole soundtrack. And I'm inside my head going, and that's how it came about. Yeah. And uh, after you'd finished writing Will You, did you thought you'd written a classic or was it just another song? No, because I'd written that before. Oh, right, okay. I wrote, and uh, this is another funny one. I wrote that song when the IRA had set a bomb off in Berkeley Square in London. And it really upset me because I read a story about a guy who'd gone out to have his sandwiches, his lunch break and it had been a sunny day so he decided to go and have his lunch in the park in Barclays Square and he just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time the bomb went off and he was killed um, and it just really caught me in a place that and I suppose I was starting to write then and I was writing the idea of how lovers might come together and at the same time as lovers might come together, that same moment or when a baby is being made or a baby is being born, somebody is being taken out because life is cruel. And, and that, there was a whole bunch of other lyrics in that song, which of course I didn't put into Breaking Glass version, but it, that was where it started from, that was what it was about originally and then when they because I'd never been a songwriter of love songs well not in those days and when uh, they said oh, well, we, we need a love song and I went, mm -hmm. oh, uh, we need a love song because it's going to be this scene between the manager and you and da -de da -de da so I thought well maybe that song and I looked at it and I, I t took out my references about Barclay Square bomb and um, I turned it into what it became, um, and that was that. I think it's, it scarred me big time because I never actually earned from the work I did, which is a real pain, you know, especially as you get older and you think, oh, hang on, 
mm. how am I going to pay the oil this winter for the heating? Or, and then, you know, I could go start thinking bad things, but I try not to because uh, it's it, the gift that I got was the fame that came with it and what I did with it.